This is going to be a very different video than one I normally post, but I hope it's going to be a safe place, and I know this is the internet, so we'll see, to talk about something that I am at the beginning of an incredibly deep dive on that I feel compelled to share with you. And I might be posting like little videos on TikTok alongside this here, but I just, I feel like I can't look away from it. Many of you know that I have had a very strong passion for talking about complex PTSD, specifically childhood PTSD, and the nature of what I've often called silent trauma, toxic hypervigilance, basically a trauma personality that when you have a certain childhood, it's sort of hard to understand who could you have been what traits and qualities might you have had had you not grown up in those environments? And for me, I don't know. Both of my parents were what I've called eggshell type parents who really struggled with their own emotional regulation. My father had severe trauma as a child, which I believe led to him deciding to not be here anymore when I was 23. That was, of course, incredibly traumatic for me. and not to mention the relationship or lack thereof, one we'd had. My mother, as I've talked about, I do believe, um, although I'm starting to question a few things about her difficulties, I do believe lived has lived her life with undiagnosed borderline, but she did not really have an identifiably traumatic childhood, not in the ways that we talk about even complex PTSD or the types of traumas that might create borderline. Now that being said, we know that these disorders, whatever you want to call them, I don't love that word, they're incredibly complex. And I do not think that we are anywhere near, I think we're at the very beginning of understanding the dynamics between our brains and our environments and how things play out. And there's been a lot of conversation around the overlap and often misdiagnoses and confusing diagnoses around borderline, complex PTSD, autism, ADHD, and even narcissistic personality disorder. And so I've been doing a deep dive specifically on understanding autism. Now, the dive I'm doing is specifically targeted to understanding what I guess would now be called level one autism. The way that autism might be related and not related to what we would think of today as often symptoms of complex PTSD, especially around things that I've talked about like hypervigilance, sensory issues, being sensitive. And I sort of, you know, uh, I've spent about 20, 25 hours in the last several days doing a deep dive. I just I read that book, the book called unmasking autism over the weekend. I've been on a ton of websites, a ton of research articles. I've ordered a couple more books. I've got the book Neurotribes I'm reading right now. And I got two more books on, ordered two more books on the presentation of autism in females. But the books are a bit older. And so I still think they're valuable, but they also don't necessarily seem to address what I'm trying to understand, which is what is the possibility that someone like myself or any of you may have in addition to or related to level one types of autistic traits. Maybe they're just subclinical traits. Maybe they're the actual full diagnosis um, as it relates to our complex, what we thought or maybe related to our complex PTSD symptoms. And you can see how I'm kind of like fumbling over my words because A, I'm at the beginning of this inquiry. I, as a psychologist, you know, what you need to understand if you don't know about this field is that it's so broad and vast that in our programs, for example, with something like autism, unless we're seeking out a specific training or course, we don't get an understanding of that. In fact, if that is going to be your specialty, let's say as a psychologist, you're going to do a lot of extra trainings and coursework and books and reading. And so for someone like me, I've done a lot of trainings on childhood trauma, on complex PTSD, on anxiety, relationships, things like that. In fact, it's part of our 
being able to renew our licenses to have continuing education. But for someone like me who's making content, I feel like that's all I'm ever doing. And to be honest, psychology has consumed so much of my life since I went back to get my doctorate that I've had to really neglect things like fiction, reading books, I still watch a lot, but I do have my downtime. I do watch a lot of streaming, you know, movies and shows. I love film and love storytelling and all, I always have. But I've been really wanting to understand and people ask me so many times to, to explain and dive into complex PTSD and autism, for example, or those two things alongside borderline. And now I'm learning more about even the possibility of that being related to narcissism. and. You know, with narcissism being such a pathologized dynamic in our culture, while not excusing intensively hurtful behaviors, it's making me wonder if in some cases we're missing more information. I'm not saying that you have to accept it or it should be okay, but it's even making me rethink people in my life who I thought were just narcissistic. It's making me rethink even my mom's own diagnosis, which I absolutely do believe is borderline. But as I'm doing more reading, and I don't have the answer to this yet, and this is why I was debating putting this out here, but I kind of want, I believe that going on this journey together might be really powerful as opposed to me just sitting up here and spitting out everything I've learned at, at some point in the near future. A part of me doesn't want to say anything until I feel like I know it all. But I don't know that that is actually realistic given the topic of autism, for example. Especially because even things like which we know that the DSM, which is what we use to di diagnose, is so deeply flawed. And even when we look at the criteria around many, 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 and the majority of our diagnoses, how they were developed, they were developed on very specific populations. In fact, they were developed often on white males, certain levels of affluence, certain levels of economic ability, right, or socioeconomic status, I should say. And a lot of the research and really everything mental health related has been really not about people of color and women and you know those of us who were outside the box, frankly. And I think it's a problem and I've been learning more and more about these dynamics, frankly, through things like TikTok and other books. But when it even comes to the criteria for autism, if you look at how it might present, a lot of really smart people are saying, we are missing out here we're missing out on the variations of autism in every population. But what I've really found is that understanding, trying to understand, you know, what role could someone having, let's, let's say, mild level one autism, a low support need. So like a person who didn't really need a lot, who could pass, who could mask through the system, what would that look like if they had lifelong chronic anxiety, which is extremely common? What would it look like if they had complex trauma, but also autism? How would that show up? And especially how might it show up as I'm looking into right now in, in those who were born or assigned female at birth, specifically because the research has been on males first and foremost, which has affected the diagnoses, the, the ratio of diagnoses. But what would it look like in a a dynamic or a population where from the time we're little, we're taught to be pleasers, we're taught to rotate around the needs of others, we're taught, especially in many you know dynamics, that fitting in is the most important thing. And yet the number of women I know who struggle with friendships and you know just all of these nuances, including myself, has making it's making me want to understand this more. Now this is a very long intro, but I have I'm gonna share more and more, especially from the book I just read called Unmasking Autism in future videos, if this is something you want to know more about. I am finding myself really fascinated by it and I used to think that autism was this whole separate thing that I'd have to be trained in and have a passion for and be specialized in, not knowing that maybe there's a possibility that not just people in my world, but my patients or those who suffer might also be under the radar in this area and might benefit. What I'm not interested in doing is trying to start saying, this is autism and this is not uh, outside of, you know, what we know would be understandable ways. What it's helping me do as I'm doing all this reading, to be honest with you, it is giving me answers to things, even if they are just subclinical traits for myself to say, oh, that's why I've always felt 
so different, for example. Maybe it's not just my complex trauma from my childhood and my adulthood, but maybe it is. I don't know. Why have I had, why do I have so many, so many significant um, sensory issues? What about all the social challenges I've had in terms of my anxiety and how I relate to people or don't? What about things that I didn't realize that may have been stimming behaviors in my childhood and in my adult life? It's just really fascinating. And I don't have all the answers, like I'm saying, and I don't know where this will end up for me. I don't know, but I feel like it's really important to share and it's it's making me so excited that I don't want to wait. And I also don't want to sit up here, you know, and say, well, this is what it is because I've been watching all these videos on YouTube and people are saying even from two years ago, well, this is autism and this is not. And I'm like, wait a minute, I just read something completely different in another research article this morning, you know? And so that's where we're at. So I know this is such a long intro, but I really, I really do want to share you with you on this journey. It makes me nervous because um, I don't, I don't like people to say mean things, and yet I feel like um, I had somebody who posted. I, I will, you know who you are, who said to me a few weeks ago, "Hey, with love, Dr. Sage, have you checked out what used to be called Aspergers?" And um, I, you know, I told my kids that, and we've talked about it, and it does tend to run in families, and so. I just felt like, I, I, you know, I'm rambling now, but what, what it's giving me is no matter why, if I just said, okay, forget about a diagnosis, which I'm not really looking for, but if I understood that my brain, that I thought everyone is like that, but I know that they're not, what would that do for me? And for example, one of the things I've just in the last 48 hours realized is that I have set up my life in a way that is really bad for my nervous system that my living in fight or flight and survival mode and still feeling it literally financially and physically and emotionally, like no matter where I'm at, you'd think I was going to be, you know, out on the street tomorrow at times, the way I operate and it is not serving me and it is burning me out. And as I've shared a little bit here, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease about five years ago, but my whole life I was a sickly kid. I got ear infections a lot. I um, I've always struggled with like feeling lazy on the one hand and you're like hyper productive on the other. So then I was like, okay, is this ADHD? You know, what could it be? And so that's what I wanted to share. So I think my son is actually about to pull in the driveway and I may have to pause this video. He's supposed to be at work today. He's actually working at a research lab, which is super exciting. Oh, maybe that's not him. Oh, it's not him. Okay. Sorry for that. Um, okay. So... Number one, I found this article and it and um, there are a lot of research links to this website, so I'm going to list it down below. I don't want to say I'm holding this up as like this is the thing. I just want to share it with you because I could not believe that I hit all five criteria and I've been clicking on the articles and reading them. And like I said, I'm going to go into a lot more research and information, but here's what it says. Five signs you may be an undiagnosed autistic woman. And this is from a website called The Other Autism, and it is written by a woman who claims and states that she was diagnosed, I think, in her 30s and with autism. And classically, for most people, they've been misdiagnosed as borderline and complex trauma and anxiety disorders and ADHD. And we can all have those things as well. Because what I'm learning is that let's just take CPTSD and, and autism, that undiagnosed autism in many regards is inherently traumatizing. Someone called it traumatism on some, I forgot what page I was on. So just the idea that you would have, let's say your brain not function in a world that doesn't necessarily make sense to you, that would require you to mask, which is to basically put on a, a view of yourself that others don't see behind, which is why people will say, well, you, you know, everyone's saying, everyone's autistic now. It's like, well, you don't seem autistic. Well. What I'm learning is that if you're actually pretty good at masking, you wouldn't think that. So I want to say publicly, I am not saying that I have autism. I am saying that I am in an inquiry and understanding autism in myself and others in neurodivergence, because remember, even complex trauma is a neurodivergent basic concept. Uh, how do I say that? Because complex trauma inherently changes the brain. And so in that sense, it can make us neurodivergent no matter what. But this is what it says. It says that, that so many of us, these adult women are hitting burnout and getting diagnosed later in life with 
what used to be called high functioning. Apparently people don't like the term high functioning and they prefer terms like high needs or low needs. And I'm learning that too. I mean, I kind of knew these things, but doing this deep dive is really helping me understand it. And because the, the reason why they say that is that, I think I'm like nerding out on this so hard, but that just because you don't seem, like just because you seem high functioning, it doesn't mean that your suffering is not equal to somebody else who is who appears less functioning. It's just a different type of difficulty, if that makes sense. So I know this is like, I'm still rambling, but I, I wanted to start this by really being clear. Okay, number one, you were labeled as highly sensitive. Now, many of us have heard the term highly sensitive person developed by Elaine Aaron. There's some debate about whether or not the highly sensitive person is actually a one type of a profile of autism and that apparently I don't know that there's a whole lot of research into this HSP dynamic and apparently down the road I read later the people that Air Elaine Aaron based some of this information on were later diagnosed as autistic now don't like quote me on that but that's what I've read and the idea is that her Elaine Aaron not talking about this actually is harmful in some ways because it doesn't open a dialogue about what it could look like in a different way and therefore potentially help people. So I'm not judging any of that. I've always identified with the idea of being highly sensitive. So what is that? So number one, you're highly sensitive or you identify with that profile. These are the things, just summary. Are easily overwhelmed by sensory stimuli, bright lights, rough fabrics, loud sounds, are highly affected by the moods of others, experience very strong emotions, both positive and negative, and have a rich emotional life, are highly conscientious and detail-oriented, have a difficult time coping with change, love to learn for the sake of learning, require a lot of alone time in order to recharge, get sick easily, especially when a lot is going on in life or after travel, take a long time to heal or reset after a traumatic or upsetting event, dislike small talk but can pretend when necessary, and can exhibit startlingly intense focus on subjects and tasks that they love, special interest. So there's a lot, if you Google HSP controversy and autism, there's a lot of information there. But if we just said, okay, for example, do you relate to those things? Okay, a lot of those things also can be under the category of autism, like sensory, issues being you know dysregulated and not being able to settle is, is easily um requiring time alone loving to learn things like that okay that was number one so you identify as an hsp number two you prefer a lot of alone time or with only one person at a time and what she's basically saying is not that you don't like people it's that being around too many people has an overwhelming dynamic to it both from your from your kind of cognitive self and your sensory self and that people who have let's say autism in general regardless of level do actually like people and can have strong bonds it's just that the way they experience friendships can be different than those who are non-autistic who are neurotypical and so it talks about conversations being overwhelming with too many people i think as i've talked about in so many videos you know i was terrible at um, and this doesn't mean I'm not saying that I have this diagnosis, I'm gonna keep saying that, but that I don't do small talk well and it gives me a lot of anxiety and it's intolerable for me, especially with people that I should like know. Like I've had mom friends after years. I'm like, why are we still at the surface? Like I don't get that and I don't enjoy that. Number three, you, are, you likely work in or have special interest in art, psychology, or science. So there's a linked article here about autistic females are very imaginative, artistic, and highly capable in the arts. This can include interest and talent in writing, painting, drawing, sculpture, singing, acting, theater, music, and so on. And then it talks about how autistic brains are also really good at science and analytical thinking. And that a lot of us end up in academia and that there are a lot of common interests in psychology for many of us. So our special interest is psychology. And she says here, since they grew up feeling different from everyone else, they often look to psychology for answers, often reading self-help books and psychology texts long before their peers. So that is definitely true for me, watching Oprah, all those self-help books in my early 20s. And that even though they are, they have a diverse range of interests, of course, 
that people with autism are overrepresented in the arts, sciences, technology, and psychology. By the way, I read a whole other article about the increase of autism in Silicon Valley families as people who are engineer tech brains having babies, that's a whole other thing. I mean, it's just been blowing my mind. I mean, I knew that, but like, I did not know that, but just looking at research, research has been interesting. Okay, so psychology as a special interest. Number four, you have probably been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, PTSD, BPD, or similar. So she talks about, which I think many of you can relate to, if we said it is possible to have level one autism, and it to be really undetectable because as I keep saying, I think we're at the beginning, the beginning. I can't even find new books on level one female phenotype autism. Like I just can't really find them. I can find articles and things like that. And, and, there, and there, I'm sure there are some, but I just think we don't understand this yet. And that's why I'm so interested in it. I know I'm talking fast. That's why I'm so interested in it because I really want to share it with you. <laughs> no one else in my family gives a crap. Okay, so it talks about how that can happen, how we can obviously have increased risk for self-wounding, um, you know, being misunderstood, feeling like we've been misdiagnosed, and then those treatments, let's say, for OCD or ADHD or, or borderline, not working for us, right? Uh, uh, so I'm saying us, but for those who, who may be on the spectrum. And then the last one is, this is the one that I was like, what? Uh, you have a high chance of having allergies, autoimmune disorders, fibromyalgia, and or connective tissue disorders. I have all of those, okay? So it says, for many women and girls, autism has a long history, and there's a great article here connected to it, of digestive problems, connective tissue disorders, like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, food and environmental allergies, and autoimmune disorders, IBS, fibromyalgia. And, you know, I was thinking also, when we know that complex trauma increases our risk for developing, we know that childhood trauma increases our risk for things like chronic illness, fibromyalgia, IBS, autoimmune disease, diabetes, cancer. So who knows how all that layers, right? Is it, is it, and I have just begun to read the full article on the science behind the autoimmune dynamic, but the, the point is, all of this is so fascinating, at least to me. And I want to just say to you, if you're an expert, if you are, I'm talking fast again because I'm excited and I have a patient soon. If you are someone, and also I feel like I'm not being like, oh, let me just give you the perfect answer here. Um, if you're someone who's an expert on autism, I'd love to hear what you think, but please be gentle in the comments saying you don't have this or you don't have that. For example, if somebody says to you and they watch, let's say my video, and they're like, I think I have that, and you say, you don't have that, you, you know, you don't have that, go, first of all, go educate yourself. Do Go do a bunch of reading and look at the research flaws in the populations. But more importantly than that, it is a very vulnerable thing. Like I could almost cry right now because it's such a sensitive issue for me to be up here saying this, but I, like I'm here because I want to help people like me and you, because so many of you that are here have trauma. And all my life I've been like, what the f is wrong with me? I'm so different. Why am I different? I've felt like an alien in friendships, in relationships, around my sensory issues. My daughter and I were, my last thing I'll say is my daughter and I were out and my daughter, as you can imagine, is similar to me in many ways. But she was like, God, like everything bothers you. And I, I was like kind of horrified, but like, I know that that's true. In fact, back when the Harry Met Sally movie came out and there was a whole conversation about you're high maintenance, but you think you're low maintenance. Like I remember relating to the fact, I knew I was high maintenance, but I'm not someone that you would, I don't think, like if you hung out with me, it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see that. Uh, it's that I feel so dysregulated at times, like stupid things bother me in ways that they shouldn't. I, my whole life I've had issues around my sensory triggers, like the smell thing can put me into a rage. Like I have a dog that has, God bless her, some kind of thing she's had her whole life. And it's just, it's, it's so triggering. And I've, I can make videos about the neighbors smoking, you know, whatever. Um, I'm not saying these things mean I am this thing. I'm just saying that trying to understand that my brain, maybe the way I think isn't everyone else thinks or experiences the world, maybe it is but it's giving me a lot of like thought and power about if I wanna live you know, the rest of my life in a way that I don't feel like I am hypervigilant all of the time, so I have to always be doing all the things that I share with you. 
if I don't want to be like that, I'm going to have to change some things. And I don't have to have necessarily a diagnosis for it, but to know that it may not just be my complex trauma. What if the way I came out of the womb and it's making me question my mom, and many of you who've been here for a long time know about that, my mom. What if parts, parts of her, because parts are like very harmful and don't seem related to autism at all, but what if some of these things that she does, I'm so sorry, my phone is going off, oh, hold on. What if some of the things that she does were like this? And the last thing I'll say is I, as I think I've shared, I don't know who my biological father is. We still can't figure it out. Even with all of the apps and all of the Ancestry.com and 23andMe, and it seems like I came from an alien. And so I don't know the family history. So it could be there, it could not be. This is less about me, but I'm going to use myself in my understanding and share with you what I'm learning. So that's it. <laughs> um, I hope you find this helpful. I hope you will just, you know, if you just wanna go along for the ride, if you wanna do more research, I'm gonna link a lot of the things down below that I'm looking at and reading. And I, I, I'm about to go somewhere soon and I'm gonna be gone for a little while and try to post videos while I'm gone. But I was thinking about maybe posting like on TikTok how I really feel about a lot of the things that when I'm traveling and how I respond to things because I think that A, it just maybe validates us, right, as human beings. But maybe there's an intolerance and a masking that's been going on just because of the way my brain works. And maybe it would be helpful to be more um, aware of that so that I can create a life and Therefore, you can learn to create a life if this applies to you too, that doesn't feel so constantly like nails on the chalkboard. Like I feel like that is how my life has felt. And I've had a ton of trauma, childhood and adulthood. I mean, literally as much an adult as childhood. So maybe this is all just my trauma brain. I don't know, but I want to share it with you. And I'm curious to hear what you think, so. I'm scared to post this, but I'm going to do it. And um, I thank you for being here. And I will see you soon.